Okay, folks, we're just going to make a couple of announcements while people are starting to come in. Look at you guys all look so wide awake and raring to go. Stop it. Will you get to be my age? This is this is where it's at right here. Hey, Edmonton, good to see you. Is Edmonton there? Hub is there, and we got the foothills. Great to see all you guys. So just a couple of quick things I wanted to say. First one is just a reminder that next week, uh, Preston Manning is going to be speaking here on uh, next on the second, and so we're going to be sending out a little bit of an email later on today just to remind people. It would be great if people showed up on time. <laughs> It'd be good. And then uh, in Edmonton and Red Deer, if you have some questions, because there's going to be an answer question sort of thing takes place. Send those to Steve by the 1st of May, and then you will, uh, we will ask some of those questions. We just want to make sure you're, you're aware that email is coming out today. And now my good friend, my buddy, Bertha, is going to make an announcement from the shelter. Woo! Hey, guys. How's it going? I hope I can be heard. Um, I just wanted to talk about the annual um, shelter lunch of a lifetime. And that's going to be happening on May 17th. You should have received an email out yesterday with a link. And uh, if you didn't receive that email, just email me, and I will send you the link to RSVP. There is transportation that's going to be there um, going from downtown to the shelter and back. So if you need that, just uh, indicate that in the RSVP form. But it's going to be a really good time for shelter staff and downtown staff and hub staff who are very much invited to um, just get together, uh, talk a bit more, get to learn more about the shelter and more about what we do here. Okay, so lunch of a lifetime. Aaron, you're more than welcome to come to the lunch of a lifetime. It's actually kind of cool. So you actually should come. It'd be great. Shirley's going to introduce our speaker this morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Aaron Weiss. It was 11 years ago that I first met Aaron. He was an undergraduate student at Ambrose University. And I was working in enrollment. And we would go together to high schools, to chapels. And he would speak. And I would try to lure people to consider uh, Ambrose as a secondary, post-secondary. Well, Aaron is born and raised here in Calgary. And he and his wife are celebrating 10 years of married life this summer. And incidentally, Rachel, his wife, um, she did a practicum here with um, Demo Koo uh, when she was a student at Ambrose. So that was kind of cool to find out. They have two beautiful twin daughters who are starting kindergarten in the fall. And since Aaron was 15, he really felt God directing him towards teaching and preaching. In fact, on uh, November of 2016, Aaron and Rachel, they became church planters. And they started Mission Hill Church in River Bend Community. So Aaron, it's so great to have you. Thank you for coming. Would you join me in welcoming Aaron Weiss? Well, good morning. I uh, great pastor move. Forgot my Bible, but I'm thankful for the internet and great apps. Um, if you would, uh, if you have your Bibles or your apps, whatever, you can join me. Um, just want to read our text for this morning, and then we'll jump right in. It's actually. John 21, verse 1 to 19 is our main text, but I'll only be reading uh, verses 15 to 19. It says this, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. And he, sent, uh, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is this he said to show by what kind of death he, would, he was to glorify God. And after saying these things, 
he said to him, follow me. Um, recognizing that this is the closest to like multi-campus I've ever preached um, as a church planter. So I'm going to try and stay put. I'm usually a bit of a walker. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to share with you this morning is I uh, had a tour of the facility and, and kind of an update of the ministries and the, the outreach that you do at Mustard Seed. And had an awesome opportunity to hear from Shirley uh, just what impact you're having in the city. And, and I was thinking on that as I was preparing for this morning. And it's amazing the, the way in which our failures, the way in which our regrets, the way in which our, our hurts just kind of carry on with us. In fact, they, they have consequences, they have history, they have stigma. What I, what I mean by that is they have a way of carrying forward injuries that we don't want to keep, but they are the scars that kind of form us and, and are formative to how we react and how we face the world. That's not just physical things. You can see that in somebody if they're anxious or if they're nervous or if they're shy. Uh, that also speaks to a history, things that, that plague us and come back, almost like flashbacks, things that you would say, I wish I could get that moment back. And then there's always the stigma of being labeled either by ourselves or by others. You're that guy or you're that girl who did that or experienced this. And this story that we that we looked at this morning, it's the follow-up. It's, it's actually the recommissioning. It's um, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appearing for the third time to his disciples, appearing to Peter and having a one-on-one, -on -one, an in-camera session to speak to him. Um, as most scholars would say, it's, it's kind of a, a very obvious uh, direct link to the fact that Peter denied him three times. In fact, historically, when we look at Scripture, we, we think of the betrayer of Jesus as Judas. And, and undoubtedly, that's true. This, this guy, it couldn't be more intimate, it couldn't be more icy, cold betrayal than to say, I'll betray you with a kiss. Takes uh, soldiers to Jesus' presence and says, when I kiss, that's the one you should arrest, and goes and does that. And we see historically, that's the betrayer. But on... In that event, in that storyline, there's actually two men who are in Jesus' inner circle. And although Peter didn't betray him by taking soldiers to his presence, he betrayed him in a very intimate and hurtful way. In his hearing, denied him three times. In fact, um, if you're to look at Luke 22, the precursor to all these events is, is Peter saying to Jesus, Jesus, I'm never going to do that. I'm your guy. You know, prison or death. Throw me in jail, take my life, I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows, that, that's just a way of saying, in short order, before the, before the next day is really in full swing, you're going to deny me three times. And of course, as we follow the story, we see that happens. And Jesus is hearing, Peter denies him three times. In fact, in, in the Gospel of John, there's an interaction where a man who is a relative of the man who Peter cut off his ear. If you don't know the story, um, soldiers appear in the garden. They're going to take Jesus away. And Peter is fired up. He's gonna, I'm going to live to my word, to my promise, prison or death. I'm with Jesus. He pulls out his sword and he lops off a guy's ear. I don't know if he had terrible aim or he was incredibly accurate. And then Jesus tells him, put it away, heals the man's ear. Th like that would have been a guy you would remember in the garden. And it was a relative of that man who was miraculously healed, says to him, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? I think I recognize you. I wouldn't forget that guy. Angry, with a sword, kind of fanatical. And Peter goes, not me. I don't know the man. The scripture says that, actually in Luke, it says as Jesus looked at him after his third denial, the rooster crows, and, and it, it hits him. He's crushed. He's, he's ashamed. He didn't just betray his friend. He betrayed his teacher. He betrayed his Lord. One of the only disciples we see previous to Jesus' death and resurrection makes a statement of faith saying, you are Lord, you are the Christ. Essentially turns his back and says, I don't know you. That's not the kind of thing you, you get past quickly. That's a wound, that's a stigma, that's a history, that's a scar, that has consequences that carry on for a long time. In fact, if you were to look at 1 Corinthians 15, we, we're given the impression that Jesus actually 
appears to Peter, resurrected, and they have a private session that we don't even get much about in, in Scripture, that he needed that kind of restoring to take place. And I started thinking about this story specifically as I, I had a, t- a tour with Shirley, and you made a comment. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to get it bang on, but uh, the mustard seed is known for giving many second chances. Am I saying that right or good enough? And I love that because I just thought, how many times do I need a second chance? How many times do I fail? How many times do I stumble? How many times do I look at my history? If I were to, I'm a very introspective person, which is deadly. Because I can look back at my past and thumb through the, the, the history of my life, and I spend more time grieving myself than I, than I do celebrating what Jesus has done. And how powerful it is that Peter, if you were to read earlier, around verse uh, 1 all the way through 19, we see that Jesus has already appeared to his disciples resurrected. I mean, that's good news. The one you betrayed, he's not dead. He's alive. But Peter's still not over it. This is me uh, speculating in the text a little bit, but I I think Peter is still really down in the dumps. He's really struggling because he says to the disciples, I'm going to go fishing. He probably feels demoted. I was the leader here or or one of the guys who had influence, and now I feel like I, I just don't qualify. I mean, everybody ran, everyone was a coward, but I was, the, I was the chief of cowards because I followed him and denied him three times. You know, not once, three times. And Jesus is here, and he looked at me. He knows that's what I did. And so he goes fishing, and to make matters worse, essentially he's saying, I'm going back to what I did before. I'm a washout. I'm going to go back to fishing, and he fishes all night, and he catches... Nothing. Like, imagine the grief. I'm no good as a follower of Christ. I'm no good as a teacher. I'm not even good as a fisherman. And then Jesus appears on the shore, and he doesn't know it's Jesus. There's some guy, and he actually responds. He says, children. I love that. It, it, what that is, it's, it's colloquial language. It's a way of saying it's slang. It's biblical slang. It's saying, hey, guys, dudes, have you caught any fish? This is just some guy on the beach, and they're like, well, no. We're professional fishermen, but we're not very good. Try the other side of the boat. And they get a a catch of fish that they can barely carry. And then one of the disciples says, that's Jesus. And he's mirror imaging the exact events that took place when he called Peter into ministry. And this is, this is how you know that this is a historical account. This isn't just somebody remembering this. It says that Peter put on his cloak, and he dove into the water and went. Like, who gets dressed before they take a swim? Peter's so excited. He's like, guys, you deal with the fish. I need to see Jesus. And he swims to Jesus. He runs to Jesus. And they have breakfast on the beach, and then they have this in-camera session. And I don't know if Jesus says, hey, guys, Peter and I have to have a one-on-one. Or if they just knew it's time for us to depart. But I, I imagine them going, you're in trouble. And then Jesus asks me, do, do you love me? That, that has beautiful intimacy on one hand. Because I, I'm sure that's the question he wanted Jesus to ask. I messed up, but Lord, I love you. And it also has a sting to it. Do you need to ask me? Don't you know my heart? I know I've messed up, but do you need to ask me? And three times he says, do you love me? And it says in the third response, he says he was grieved. He's like, Lord, I know that I love you. Many scholars would say three questions for three denials. I, I, I think that's a good assumption, but I think this is more just for Peter's heart. That you would know beyond the shadow of a doubt, this is behind us, Peter. I'm just going to ask you three times. And my response is going to be the same. Feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. What he's speaking to metaphorically is saying, love my church. You know what it is to be wounded. Now take care of my church. See, I love this. Because what, what I, if I could just simply say what I want to say to you this morning, it's the value of our failures. You know, the importance of our mistakes. Um, I'm, it was said already that, that I'm a church planter. We're two years into our church plant, and I'm learning that uh, if you want to meet beat-up people in ministry, go talk to church planters. It's hard. 
I haven't experienced more uh, hardship in my life than these last two years, and I haven't had to press more deeply into a walk with Christ than ever before. And, and I honestly went into this thinking, this is going to be fun. And it has been completely the opposite. It has been hard. It has been grueling. But we have seen the Lord's faithfulness. And what I've discovered is this. He has made glorified. He's strong. He is uh, able and he is sufficient in my weakness. What we're learning, what we're pressing into is let's just be weak. Because Jesus shows up really strong. We need to have a heart. And I, I, I want to share this with two audiences in mind. Both to you as staff. Both for your personal life, but also as you minister to others. And then to encourage those who might be residents or that you're ministering to through the mustard seed. Because it's an incredible message to say to somebody who is rebounding from or just fresh from a mistake, a failure, a hardship, a wound, to say something of encouragement because really the reality is this. I use three I words as pastors use alliteration, um, but mainly so that I would be able to remember them. That There's an ability for instruction, for injury and for intimacy. What I mean by instruction is this, that Secular understanding would tell you failures are, are great teaching opportunities, and that's true. You probably lose, or sorry, you probably learn more through losing games than you do by winning them. But the gospel takes that a step further. It's not just instruction on how to be better, play better, do better. This is instruction to realize you're not good enough. You need Jesus. This is an instruction so that you can move forward. This is. Jesus is sitting down with Peter going, are you going to do this your way again? I think not. Notice at the end he says, when you are a child, you dress yourself, but when you're an adult, others are going to dress you. That's backwards. I have twin girls. They're five. If I let them dress themselves, they will be princesses every day. And that, that's cute for a while, but after a while, they're, they're, they're little... You know, Disney costumes get stained and gross. You know, I need to dress them. I need to take care of them. I need to help them. As an adult, I'm, I'm trusting they're going to be okay. Jesus flips that around to say, when you were immature, when you lacked instruction, you did your own thing, and this is where it gets you. Now that you have grown, you know who to rely on. You know who to ask. You know who to lean on. You know who to press into. That's me. It's also for our injury. You might not like that word, but see, our scars serve more than just a way of saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, burn your hand on a hot stove. You'll, you'll learn not to do that again. It's, it's deeper than that. It demonstrates that you need somebody to heal you because you have wounds and scars you can't carry uh, or you can't fix on your own. And it's just so deeper than physical. This is emotional, this is spiritual, this is relational. Broken relationships and emotional scars take years to heal, and they need a Savior. You can't fix that yourself. You need Jesus. One of the reasons that uh, I began speaking uh, at Ambrose University, uh, I think part of the relationship that I started with, with Shirley was I was speaking to youth uh, ministries from my own personal experience as a, as a young person who struggled with uh, an eating disorder, self-image issues, and an addiction to exercise. You might think that's a good addiction, but it can actually be bad. And I shared that with many students around this city, and actually uh, through that experience, just got to see how, wow, there's not just myself who struggles with this, but many students. But what I learned through that process was, I didn't know where to point these kids. They would come to me and say things like, how did you get out of this? How did, how did you find healing? How are you processing? And it was really empty unless I just said, you need to go to Jesus. He's the only healer. He's the good shepherd. See, these scars, these are not war wounds of pride. These are ways of saying, I've been healed. I, I can get through this only through him. In addition, it's intimacy. I love the picture uh, of this interaction that Jesus has with Peter. 
they sit down, they have this meal, and they say, we need to talk. And he's not only speaking love and, and, and kindness and forgiveness into his life, he, he's actually speaking a reaffirmation and a reconfirmation of ministry. Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. The, the picture is this. You're not qualified because you're really good, Peter. You're qualified because I called you. And I'm going to use this experience to do something really good in your life. In fact, one of the things that we reject or, or we shy away from, yet I would encourage the church to begin embracing more and more, is that it's Romans 8. That the Lord uses all things for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. That, that God is big enough to orchestrate beautiful things through really garbage and, and horrible situations. Peter, I'm, I'm calling you into ministry. I want you to take care of my sheep. I want you to take care of the church. And guess who's going to bite the most? Sheep. I can say that because I'm, I'm an under-shepherd in the church. They're unruly. They're going to hurt you. That's okay. They hurt me. They hung me on a cross. And I love them. I died for them. You need to have that passion in your life, in your ministry. See, um, I want to close with this thought. As an encouragement to you, uh, as well as an encouragement to anyone who will be ministering to you. This is actually Genesis 50, verse 20. This is actually Joseph who's speaking. He's speaking to his brothers who had sold him into slavery. He went from a horrible situation to a worse situation to a worse situation until finally through the most dark situation that he could find himself. Um, God elevates him to vice regent, to prime minister, second in all of Egypt. You know the story. And after a long series of events, his brothers who uh, sold him and betrayed him, by the way, the mistake that he made he is a cocky brother. He bragged to his siblings. I mean, that kind of thing, you deserve a bloody nose, a couple of noogies, and a wedgie. You don't deserve to be sold into slavery. You don't deserve a life of servitude in a foreign country. You don't deserve to be you know, uh, accused of crimes you've never committed. And yet, there he is. And at the end of all that, he's got a moment where he could take his revenge. He would have been justified to do so. And this is what he says. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He's saying God, God meant what you had to hurt me for good. He saw these mistakes. He saw these failures. He saw every consequence of this, and he had a plan to, to do something incredible. That's not just an encouragement for you. I don't know the stories in this room. That's an encouragement for everyone you speak your just healing words into. Say, hey, you know what? Somebody might have meant this for evil. God meant this for good. I actually love what Jesus says to Peter in, in the foreshadow of this uh, interaction. It says that Satan, this is, uh, sorry, Luke 22, verse 31. It says, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. No, it's like Jesus is like, I know how this is going to play out. But you need to walk through some really hard stuff right now. You know what he's saying? Satan wants to destroy you. I prayed for you. When you have turned again, it's almost like you're going to go through a valley here, but when you're on the other side, I'm going to use you. You're going to do incredible things. And not through your strength, but because you're going to get educated through your injury and through the intimacy of growing in a, a relationship with me that you'll understand how to do ministry right. I hope that's an encouragement for you. Let me pray for you, and then I'll, I'll hand this back over. Heavenly Father, I just I ask, just your blessing over the mustard seed, the ministries that are throughout the city and uh, Edmonton as well, Lord. I pray for the staff, the many ways in which they impact lives. They speak comfort and encouragement. 
they offer helps and Lord at time admonishment to correct things because at, at times we get stuck and we need more than just a gentle word we need a, a nudge in the right direction Lord I just pray that you would give me great courage wisdom love the fullness of the Holy Spirit to do that I ask that Jesus your name would be elevated and and Lord, as we put down our flags to raise up the flag of Jesus, I pray that you would honor that and you would bless that, Lord, that, that you would have greater increase, not for our fame or glory, but for yours. I pray, Jesus, that there would be greater boldness in our hearts to give over to you the wounds that we have that maybe we're trying to fix ourselves, to not embrace as, as to be proud, but to embrace as to accept what you are teaching us through our hurts and our heartache. They don't mark us as broken men and women. They mark us as men and women who need a Savior that, that we would draw in a deeper, deeper intimacy with you. So I just pray these things over everyone in their hearing and to encourage us in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.